So I think, I think you can definitely walk away um, with something you can use no matter what discipline area you're teaching in um, or, you know, what sort of site. Um, I know in incarcerated situations where you're teaching the jails, it's a little bit harder to bring in technology, but I'm sure you're going to find something here that you can use. So our objectives today are here, as you can see, to consider how to choose vocabulary to explicitly teach. So I love technology. But integration of technology, just because I love it, is not a good practice. So I always like to think of pedagogy, or in our case, andragogy, the teaching of adults. Good instruction has to come first, and technology um, is the tool that we can use to teach better and help our students learn and retain the information better. So I'm, I'm going to be starting off with a little bit of teacherly stuff today but so don't leave me we'll get to the good stuff but I think that we all need a good foundation just about teaching vocabulary whether we have technology or not to do that um, our second objective is to learn and apply a research proven six-step process for teaching vocabulary effectively and I believe that you will discover and practice technology tools now this as a um, Melinda mentioned at the beginning, um, this was a three hour hands on workshop that over the past week I've really had to reimagine. Um, you'll see my email at the beginning. Um, I'll give that at the end. Feel free to contact me. I'm pretty much glued to my computer for the next couple of months, it seems like. So um, we're going to see ways that you can, uh, different things that you can use to teach vocabulary that will help students remember and demonstrate their understanding. And you also will be able to create. Um, you, I'm sorry, students will be able to create things using technology, using the new vocabulary for each step of this six step process. So my goal is that you will walk away from the session with at least one new idea. I imagine there will be a lot more. And um, at the end of this workshop, a lot of times teachers ask me, how do you find the time to do all of this in your class? I don't. I'm just looking, I'm giving a survey of many different possibilities. And um, whenever you're trying something brand new, you should start small. I think that you probably know that. So take baby steps and start small. So um, I noticed that not a lot of people um, who did take the survey um, telling what which tech tools they use. No one put Padlet. I do imagine that a lot of you are familiar with Padlet, but maybe you haven't hadn't thought of how you could use it for teaching vocabulary. So um, you could type this in. In a moment, I'm going to click on the link and I'm going to paste it in the chat so you'll be able to cl click on it. Um, it would be really cool if you are working on a computer and you have your phone, you could open up a QR code scanner and just scan that QR code, okay? So if you're not able to get onto this Padlet, I'm gonna demonstrate it in just a minute, then if you want to just type, type in the chat your answers to these three questions, which are, um, what does it know to what does it mean to know a word? How many exposures to a new word are necessary for language learners and even you know English as a first language folks to acquire and retain a new word? And how do you select which words from whatever content you're teaching to explain? explicitly teach to your students? How do you select which words would be good for them to know? So I'm going to go ahead and open this and you can see um, Padlet is just basically a wall and all you really need to do, I have the questions here and I'm going to paste this in the chat in just a moment and basically um, all you really need to do is to double tap or double click and you'll see a box like this one that's here. So someone just already entered to be able to use the word means to know the word. And then how many exposures do you think are necessary? And um, how do you select the words to, uh, to explicitly teach? So if I just double cl click or do I double tap anywhere? Um, and if you decide, oh, I changed my mind, you can delete it. Um, you don't need to put a title. You're just gonna type in something, okay? So Christy, we have um, one in the chat. To really know, understand, and use vocabulary in your speaking vocabulary appro appropriately. Use the um, word appropriately. Yeah. Okay, Multiple exposures. There is research behind this. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, there is. Okay, so I'm gonna start reading what we have here. And you can see, um, this is something you could do with your class. You could have them be answering some questions, you know, related to vocabulary on a Padlet wall. Super easy, to, uh, completely free. Everything I'm gonna to show today is completely free. And especially notice that I'll, you, I've been bombarded with emails for all the different kinds of websites I've signed up with, and they're offering all kinds of premium services for free these days. So to recognize and understand when it's spoken or read to pronounce it, knowing a word means you can use it in context in writing or speaking. It looks like anywhere from 70 to 20 exposures will help you retain the new word um, to be able to use it in the sentence at least 10 exposures, personalize the word. Words that can be applicable to students' lives. Well, it seems like you've, you've already read some of the research that um, I have. So we'll give you just another minute or two. And if you can see everybody else's, you can just scroll up and down to see their responses. I like this, teach words that go with a theme or a skill. So not random words that we just pick up, but in context. So Andrea is adding, so this is another thing that you could do with Padlet. You could ask students a question, and what, what you might have seen is when you, um, when you double click or double tap, you have options to take a picture with a webcam, to upload a picture, you can embed a video. It's really a wonderful tool. So if you haven't used it, you really do need to start using Pat. Um, very simple, as you can see, students don't need to log into anything. They can make a mistake and delete it. So I see a lot of things I'm gonna mention in just a moment. So. We're going to look at the answers to these according to research. Um, everything here isn't just stuff I've made up. I've, I've been really reading all I can about um, how to best teach vocabulary, as I said, for about the past five years. I've been really into this because I would teach a vocabulary word one day, and the next day the students would come to class, and it was like blank slate. It was like I even mentioned the word before. They had no idea what I was talking about. So I find a better way to help my students retain the vocabulary I was teaching. So what does it mean to really know a word? For those of us who have studied language acquisition, we know that there's the receptive skills, so having receptive knowledge. What does receptive mean to you, especially you ESL teachers? What skills are receptive skills? We have listening and reading coming up a lot. Yes, perfect, yes. But we really want them to move the new vocabulary into their productive knowledge. When I say productive skills, what comes to your mind? Yes, we want them to understand the words when they hear it, when they read it, but also to be able to write and to speak using those words. That's when you truly know a word. Well, there are all kinds of different aspects of knowing a word, knowing the form, the meaning, and the use. So knowing how to pronounce a word, right? The spelling, the word parts, like how a prefix or a suffix may change the word just a bit. Um, the forms, singular, plural, inflections, and word family. We have a lot of those in English where a word can be an adjective, a noun, it could be a verb, and it has different forms like the adjectives, the comparative and superlatives, and the noun forms. We want students to be able to learn associations and synonyms. So that goes with context, the association. And synonyms, when we start teaching synonyms and helping students to use tools to find synonyms, their vocabulary repertoire is going to really grow then. We want students to be able to understand the denotative versus the connotative. So there's denotative when we look it up in the dictionary, but we know in culture that we use words in lots of different ways. So an example would be rat. When I look up the dictionary definition, it tells me it's this small rodent mammal. But when I call someone a rat, that means something quite different, right? The connotative meaning. Polysemy. Oh, geez, we have this a lot in English. I feel really sorry for some of our language learners sometimes that one word can have multiple meanings in different contexts. 
the grammatical function or part of speech is something, especially for those of us teaching ESL, that we like to teach that. Um, it gives students a good foundation for when they go on with their action. But things like knowing if it's a noun, verb, adjective, the nine parts of speech. Co-locations. Can anybody type in the chat what that means? Thinking back to your teacher training, if, you've, if you did cover that at all, what is a word co-location? Um, sometimes when we're teaching um, noun or verb preposition combinations. So there's this site. I'm going to just take you there. It's a very simple site. I hope it doesn't go away because it doesn't look super professional, but it's called Just the Word. Just the Word. And, you know, sometimes when um, I'm trying to teach some vocabulary and I'm not really sure what, what all the contexts are, like maybe I want to see angry and I want to see all the different contexts, the different words that go together with angry. Okay, so we've got noun combinations, an angry reaction, an angry response, an angry letter, an angry word, an angry face. Okay, what are the prepositions that go with angry? Oh, you can be angry with, at, about, or over. Oh, that's interesting. My grammar book said mostly at, right? So, okay, for you, when you're really getting to the nitty gritty, um, you could teach this to your students, okay? Or you could just refer them there. And Christy, we have a question. I, sure. I think it's related to the site you were just showing. Mm -hmm. Timely vocabulary, outbreak, epidemic, pandemic, mm. flatten the curve. Okay, let me look at that again. Yeah. So you can see on the site, it will have popular searches and recent searches. It changed a little bit. Economic angry, because that's probably because I, I was searching for angry. But um, you can see that it will put the frequently looked up co-locations there. So things like interested in is sometimes, you know, the different preposition combinations. I know that language learners often have confusion with make versus do. I'm sure you have your own if you're an English teacher in, in particular. Um, those common mistakes that students keep keep making. This can help them. This can help you just the word. And then someone mentioned on the palette post register. That means the variety. So I don't know about you, sometimes students are using translators in my class and writing something, and they maybe write guy when really it was more of a formal type of writing when they should have written man, that kind of thing. That a word can have um, different forms, same meaning different words, um, that can mean different things depending on the level of formality. So how many exposures to a word are necessary to move the word from receptive knowledge into productive knowledge? Well, one, if we just teach today one new word, the typical student average intent, uh, attention, I'm sorry, average intelligence, um, someone who you know, studies, a good student, basically, really, the chances that student will remember that word tomorrow when you've only exposed it once, unless we've done a lot, a lot of exercises with it, they'll, they'll uh, retain it or remember that word at a rate of 5 to 14 percent. Sometimes we teach a word one time and the students was actually familiar with it before, so we're helping with that. But if we are teaching brand new vocabulary. We need something between five and 20 or more exposures. It really depends. Um, looking at the research, and I saw someone posted on Palette as well, um, the research is all over there. I mean, it depends on the researcher, basically. So if we just imagine that if we can give our students 20 exposures, that would be that would be a good, um, good number to hit for. So there's repetition. Um, again, this depends on several factors, including the age of the student. So, um, you know, if some of our students haven't been in school for quite a while, I like to make the metaphor of a sponge. And so that's how I kind of explain to the students to, to you know, relieve their fears. You're all welcome here. This is, this is a country where it doesn't matter how old you are to go back to school. So if your brain is kind of dry, well, we're going to get it wet and it's going to be able to soak up more information as we go on. So, um, yeah, we need to have students see, say, write many, many times so that they can actually eventually produce the new words. I love this book. I don't know if you've heard of it. 
Um, it's awesome. This guy, um, he took, he's a neurologist or something. I don't know, brain science. He took all the research, our brains and how we learn and remember and retain things, and he put it into layman's terms. So I can understand this. It's not like a journal. A scientific journal and it's really awesome um, he had if you do a search you can find all of his videos as well but I really do recommend the book and I don't know if you know this I always tell students this do you know why in the United States our telephone numbers of the area code are seven numbers and they you know a lot of students from other countries have a lot longer telephone numbers but a lot of them is seven as well seven well, it's because our brain can hold seven pieces of new information for 30 seconds. Okay. Well, nowadays when, <laughs> nowadays when someone, you know, wants to share their telephone number, now we have our, our phones, of course. So some people are saying our phones are actually making us dumb. But um, this is an important thing for us to remember as teachers. If we aren't having students repeat the information very soon, it will disappear. So it's so disappointing sometimes when you spend so much time in your lesson plan and the vocabulary instruction comes right at the end and you don't get a, give stand, uh, students a chance to practice. Well, there are a lot of tech tools here today that you could use to have them go home and practice immediately after if it, your vocabulary instruction comes at the end. So if, if this information is repeated within 30 seconds, the chances that the brain will retain it um, is one to two hours for the duration. So really for optimal chances of retaining new information, two hour intervals of repetition of new information and repeated spaced interval practice is the optimum that we're studying, we're shooting for. I'm not a reading expert at all, but someone told me about the five finger rule once. So if you teach reading, and we probably all do even in CTE, you have students do some reading, right? So this five finger rule is something I'm using a lot more as a language instructor. Um, I'm getting better these 22 years of teaching at picking texts that are appropriate for my students level. But in the beginning, I noticed that sometimes I would give students a text and they would be using their translators for every other word. And it was a little bit discouraging. And I was wondering, what did I do wrong here? Is this, does the student just want to really understand every single word? Or is the text too hard? Well, the truth is probably the te text was too difficult. So for extensive reading, that's like reading for pleasure or reading multiple texts on the same topic. Students can read 95% of that. So we should choose a text that we, when we look at it, a one page text that we think the students will be able to understand 95% of the words, they're gonna do fine. Without any pre-teaching, um, we need to reduce the five finger rule probably down to two. For intensive reading, like this is the type of reading that we do for tests especially. Um, when we're creating different reading te tests, um, if the students understand less than 90%, the text is too difficult. So it's a good little rule. Um, maybe you're a reading expert and you have other ways of thinking of it, but I, I like to think of this when I'm choosing text. Why am I talking about text? Well, that's where the vocabulary that we teach should really come from. So I have a couple of sites that I think are really useful. Sometimes, you know, I have different textbooks that I use for in-class reading and so on, but sometimes I see something on the internet that is just perfect. I love the topic. This is exactly what, you know, I, where I want to take my class. But when I look at it, it's a little bit too hard, I think. It does not pass the five finger rule. So what do I do? Do I, do I teach more of the vocabulary and spend like a whole day teaching vocabulary? Well, there's some tools that we can use that can really help us. One is text compactor. It's pretty simple, but let me show you. Okay, basically, you can paste a text into the box. Okay, you know, now there it is. Hold on. I'm going to have to just minimize out for just a second. Okay, 
I have this text. I just picked it from Wikipedia, okay, just to give, give a quick example. Paste in some text, and you can use a slider, and it's going to summarize a little bit the text. So you can use the slider and it'll put in more of the words. Okay, so that's one tool. Um, the other tool is the one that um, I shared with some teachers at my school and they love it, is Rewordify. It's pretty robust. So what you do is you can either paste in some text or even a URL, a website. Okay, so I pasted in the same text, rewordify the text. And what it does is it takes out some of the challenging vocabulary and it puts it in parentheses with words that are more simple. And when I go, so here, big important trip, when I mouse over it, I can see that it says expedition is the actual word that was there. And when I click on that, I can see the definition and I can hear the words spoken if I click on the speaker. More than two, but not a lot of several. Okay. Legal control, jurisdiction. So this could be something that you teach your students to use as well. Then what else it has is lots of learning activities that you can print out. And um, it can also show you the parts of speech. So this could be useful as well. It shows me that every gray highlighted word is a noun, etc. So that has a great potential, I think. We're gonna get to another one that's even better in just a moment, but um, I don't know how many of you have experience teaching K through 12, teaching kids. I, I'm sure that you entered adult education with an appreciation of the differences, um, the discipline things, um, you know, the Christine, motivation. Just, just mm -hmm. so you know, there are a few no's. Okay, good. Okay. So those of us who are in adult ed, we probably chose this because while we like children, um, adults kind of are awesome, right, to teach, right? So anyway, if you have taught K through 12, you probably are more familiar with Lexile level, and I really even don't understand what that means. But here is one site, Readable, and here are a couple others where you can put in some text and it's gonna tell you the Lexile level and so on. So for those of you in K through 12, that could be useful for you. For those of us who've only ever done adult, I don't know what that means. I probably could do some reading and find out and then I could understand and use these sites, but I just wanted to mention those. So what is a good method for selecting which words to explicitly teach? What is your method? For those of you who've been teaching ESL, you probably, um, you, maybe you've studied languages yourself. There are cognates and false cognates, right? So it's, sometimes it's really important with some of our students to point out the false cognates. I have students, the Spanish speakers always say to me, tomorrow I cannot assist class. And so, you know, yes, we have assist, the same word, but it means something different in talking about attending. So, you know, sometimes we have to point those out. Um, there are some that are just, you know, they'll still be understood if they use the false cognate, but sometimes the meaning can be lost. So I heard a lot of what I'm going to say right here um, read to me. We need to make sure they understand the most frequently used words, okay? And um, this comes from corpus linguistics. So this is where some people spend their lives collecting texts and seeing which words rise to the top, okay? Which ones are used most frequently. So for low level ESL, you know, there's the sight words and the basic word list, something called the adult basic word list. This is from like 1950 and it was based on children's literature, but it still can be useful because we know if it, if we're teaching the low levels of literacy, they still need, they need to start off with just basic words, right? If you're teaching kind of like intermediate ESL, you might wanna have a look at the new general service list. Those are the 2,800 high frequency words for ESL learners. And then for those of us teaching ASE and all the other maybe high level ESL, there's the academic word list. 
Um, so that is a pretty long list. Um, but these are the words that come from college textbooks. These are the, student, the words that for college and career readiness our students need to know, okay? So here's a cool tool. It's called the AWL highlight, highlighter, the academic word list highlighter. You'll see it's a lot like rewordify. Um, you go there, you copy in some text, you click on submit, it will highlight the words that appear on the academic word list. I mean, sometimes I look at a text and I know that there are words that my students won't understand, but I really wanna hit on those academic word lists because I want them to continue their education or to go on to a better job. That's their goal, right? So it will highlight those. So right now I know exactly which words I should teach. So that is very helpful. It does other things for you. You can do um, a simple gap fill. Sometimes we call that close, okay? Um, and it, it can do it on word families and so on. So that, that's a great tool right here um, if you're teaching kind of higher level. It tells us what sublist of the academic word list each of these words appear in. So that's an academic word list highlighter. Well, we really should be teaching words from text or from videos and so on, things that we're using. Um, I've known teachers, you know, great teachers, but, you know, sometimes I have a vocabulary book with a list of 20 words and study these 20 words. You're going to be tested on these 20 words next week. Um, you know, unless you're teaching very beginning level ESL where you're teaching a theme like, okay, clothing, and here's a list of clothing with pictures and we're going to practice and you'll have a test on that next week. But if the words are, have no relation or not built around a context, they're not gonna really remember those words very well. So how can we do this? Sometimes we need to ask students, and that's what someone, someone said in the chat. How do you choose which words to explicitly teach? Ask students if they know the word. That could save a lot of time right there too. So if we were in a face-to-face -face class, I could have you hold up your thumb or hold up a number. So I'm gonna just think of, as we're maybe going with our teaching online for the rest of the spring, this is maybe how you could do it in some sort of online setting with your students. So I'm gonna say a word and you type in the chat. We'll just do a couple. Attitude, type a one if you have never seen or heard this word. Oh, I think I have a really good class here. Um, type a two if you have seen or heard this word but you don't know what it means, a three, um, I think I know a meaning for this word and a four. Most I can explain this. People are typing word. a four. One person, two people have typed ones. We got a three to four. Okay. I'm pretty sure they were just practicing, <laughs> playing the role of student. Yes. So you could do this. And then you could, if someone's, if some students are saying fours, you can explain the word and use it in a sense. Okay. Tell the class. Tell us what this word means and use it in a sentence. So you can take some of the work off of yourself right there, okay? So that's something um, that was normally in the classroom, but how you could maybe transform it for online. Okay, so <clears throat> I was trying to think how I'm going to, I'm going back next week, and in my conversation class, we're gonna talk about food and cooking, okay? So um, I wanna, before I actually, you know, go deep into kitchen utensils and all that. Maybe I just want to see what they know. So this is how you could do this either in a on-ground face-to-face class or online. I'm going to show you a picture. So class, we're going to be um, learning about the rooms of the house and this week is about the kitchen. I'm going to show you a picture and I want you to type in the chat as many words as you know for what you see in the picture. Is everybody ready? Here we go. What do you see? Let's see how much my class knows. What vocabulary do they know about the kitchen? Modern. Modern. Microwave. Microwave. Lamp. Microwave. Stools. The backsplash. Refrigerator. Wow, oven, okay, hold on. <laughs> colors. Refrigerator, appliance, lamp, <laughs> Ikea. <laughs> yeah, it does look like Ikea. Clean. Dishwasher. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I know my class. Okay, wait, um, people when stop. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When they, someone says backsplash, I don't need to spend much time teaching the vocabulary, right? But if they're, if they're not getting some of the common things that I see there, maybe I need to spend some time. 
So that's something you could do. I think pictures, such a great way to elicit from students what they already know. So you could preview showing a picture, or if you're gonna use Zoom, Google Hangouts, FaceTime, something like that, Google Duo I mentioned here because I had not really heard of it, but I heard of it this week that it's kind of, um, whereas FaceTime, everybody needs an Apple product, but with Google Duo, you can use any sort of product, Android or whatever. But maybe if, you, if you're going to think of te teaching online at all, maybe you could do breakout rooms or you could um, assign students to, in groups to teach each other and see if the group can do some peer teaching for words they, don't, they know. And if the, everybody in the group does not know the word, then okay, then I'll need to plan a lesson. For this kind of activity, would you have an open mic so that all students can answer? I think I would. You know, um, I've been teaching hybrid for about five years, so that means about three hours of my 12-hour class um, has been online for the last five years, but teaching fully online is something that's new for a lot of us. I don't know about anybody here in this webinar today. You probably wouldn't be here if you've already taught fully online. Um, I'm an experiment. I'm going to model the growth mindset. I'm just praying and hoping with constant contact with my students that they'll stick around. And so I've already emailed them multiple times and, you know, we set up Remind and things like that. But you, you need to know your students, right? And know your own abilities and comfort level, definitely. So thanks for that question. Let's move on. You could also use some polling tools. Um, in uh, on OTAN's website, there is an article about Pear Deck, which is um, an add-on for Google Slides that, you know, if I were to use it right now, what it would be is I would present some information and then there'd be a little poll that we would see live results um, of, you know, you answering questions. This is a simple, simple, easy one. You don't need to sign up or anything. It gives you a poll for, like, a week. It's good for a week. No login, nothing like that. It's called direct poll. So I'll show you what that looks like and then I will show you what the teacher sees and what you could project to an entire class. So um, if you've been to a gas station where when you get out to pump the gas after you put in your card, it starts showing a little video like a commercial or a little news clip. Well, um, I think this is at Arco. I got gas one time and it started showing this little video. It was about vocabulary and it was telling you what the meaning of pultritude was. And honestly, I had not really heard, I think maybe once in my life, I've seen the word pultritude and I just kind of glossed over it. Um, so when you go to this poll, <laughs> it's going to ask you, Multiple choice. So you could, you could have multiple questions. I only put one question. What does pultritude mean? Does it mean ugliness, beauty, friendliness, or disgust? So you check in the box and you click on vote. And what I will see, if you want to, you can just type in the chat, okay? And what I will see and what I could project to students would be this. Okay, three of you said it means, four of you said it means ugliness, four, beauty, one, friendliness, 15, disgust. Okay, nobody cheated, right? None of you like Googled it real fast, did you? Just a little. Okay. Yeah, I had no idea. This word just sounds and looks disgusting, <laughs> but it means beauty. Can you believe that? What a weird word. Anyway, it's not a word I would probably teach my students because I don't think they'll ever see that word. But pultritude means beauty. So this direct poll, super easy. Like you could do it on the fly, create a quick poll. It gives you the link for voters and then it gives you the link for you to project the results. So easy. Um, you... Poll Everywhere has been around for a super long time. It used to be a separate app type thing, but now it's integrated with PowerPoint. So if you were presenting a PowerPoint, you could 
have this add-in and you could do polling. Students could be polling by their phones as well. I love all the Google products. Google Forms, I, I'm just going to show you this if you'd like to come back later to um, try taking the quiz. You can make a quiz on Google Forms. So I'll show you my sample. I tried to pick a variety of different question types so you can see what it looks like. So let's say we're studying parts of the car. So you can have questions be required, and I set this up as a quiz, and it could be a pre. So before I'm going to start teaching the names for the parts of the car, you're going to take this quiz. I can see what you know, what you don't know. And at the end, I could use it as the post to prove to myself that I've done a good job teaching. So you can make questions required or not. You could give point values when you create as a quiz. So what is the image below? Anybody know what that is? I, I would say speedometer and odometer, and then I don't know, someone else here, is, you know, probably knows a lot more. So I'm just going to take the quiz so you can see what the student would see. I'm just going to put in uh, odometer. Okay, where is he? He is relaxing on the, what do you think, brake, seatbelt, engine, or hood? Type it in the chat. Hood, car, hood, hood, hood. hood okay, hood, we're going to choose hood. hood. Logo. <laughs> Ooh, almost. His knee is a little bit back. It's 8 p.m. You need to turn on your, so here we can choose engine, headlights, turn signal, hazard lights, radio, or air conditioner. What do you think? I'm going to just choose one wrong just so you can see what, what that will look like. How do you rate your knowledge? So you see different question types. How do you rate your knowledge of vocabulary related to cars? So they can choose mm, on this Likert, I'm an automotive technician. It's my job. Of course, I know everything. Or I don't know what a car is. <laughs> I mean, this is just, you know, to make it kind of interesting. I'm just going to choose kind of neutral. And I submit. Oh, and it did, I forgot to choose one right here. Let's go back. We'll just choose that one. Okay. So submit. And you can set it up so that students can see their results or not. I'm going to go ahead and view. Oh, see, this one I would need to manually check. And you can put in feedback. So you could put in feedback that's just a word. You can put in feed feedback that's a video. So feedback on both correct or incorrect answers. And it shows me which parts I got wrong. Okay, so you could give immediate feedback to, their, to the students. So it's just a Google form, but at the end, you set it up as a quiz. So that's something you could use with your students to find out which vocabulary words they know or not, or to test them. Okay, there are some words that we don't need to take time to teach. We can just leave those words to incidental learning or to gloss. What does gloss mean to you? Think of glossary. So words we can just leave to incidental learning, like just kind of, you know, just, let them read the text and not focus, or to gloss, to just provide a definition or to pull up a Google image or something, are those words that are lower frequency words, words that they're not likely to ever see again. And, um, you know, we can just give a quick definition for words that they're not likely to see again with the an image, a quick or short definition or explan explanation. So uh, just my quick example is one time uh, in my class, we we're reading about the future and innovations and inventions and so on. And the word was futurologist. They kind of had a good understanding what that might mean anyway, because being familiar with ology, ologist, but I don't need to teach them that word. I'll just tell them, you know, a futurologist is someone who studies what may happen in the future. They're not going to ever use that word again, I don't think, right? So I'm going to give you a second to think and to type in the chat, what is your best classroom activity for vocabulary teaching? Because we're going to think about how that classroom activity could be moved possibly online or with more technology support. Pictures, realia and pictures for level one. Matching pictures to text, putting a Snoopy picture every day, draw a symbol or picture, vocab for the test, 
uh, one where students work together, lots of repetition, picture mm -hmm. and words, dictation, write, recite, use Google Translate, spelling lists, video, TPR, Quizlet, labeling a picture in level one, you know, write a sentence using a word is really good for higher level students yes. than sharing good examples with the whole class. Uh, match, word meeting, Quizlet live. Okay. Here's lots of great things. They're, they're, they're still typing. Okay. <laughs> Pronunciation, pictures with words. Uh, after students choose which words they don't know, give verbal examples on the spot, then write sentences on the board using the words. Tiny nice. cards. Oh. Definitions. What are tiny cards? Ooh, I don't know. That was from Marisol cards? Richmond. We'll have to. Hi, Marisol. Uh, pictures and students use Oxford Picture Dictionary to find word. Duolingo. Cool. A couple of Duolingos here. Bingo with pictures for fun. Fun. And it's starting to slow down. There we go. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Well, some of you took the survey that went out with um, the... Uh, announcement about you know how to get to this webinar and these were some of your answers so I kind of categorize them some are vocabulary or ESL specific like learning chocolate is great for you know beginning ESL Quizlet is specific for teaching vocabulary not necessarily ESL games to learn English spelling vocabulary city a4 ESL vocabulary.com many things at org English for everyone VOA news language guide.org then there were some just general tools, not specific to teaching vocabulary, but that you use Google Slides, online dictionary, YouTube. A lot of you put reading specific sites, and some of them are ESL specific. ReadWorks, great source. I think everything is free there now, as Newzella has made everything free, I believe, right now, right, too. News and Levels, so it's great for multi-level ESL. Breaking News English, oh my gosh, that man who creates that site. It's like full lessons, you know, um, but they are print materials for the most part. Um, English Discoveries was a new one for me. That's kind of an online platform that one of you uses. Um, then we have a lot of publisher product specific tools, things that are teaching our students, but that we can't really interact too much with the students through these tools. So that's my one little negative point about those, but they go very well with any textbooks that you're using. The gamification is very big in K through 12 and in adult ed, we're catching on. Kahoot has like, rise, you know, so high in popularity, but there are a lot of other things like quizzes that we can do. Um, <clears throat> some of you are using Google Classroom for the learning management um, system. Some of you may be using Canvas, especially if you're part of a, a, a California community college. Some of you maybe it looked like you created a Weebly website for your class. Um, communication tools, WhatsApp, a lot of our students use that, so um, makes sense that we use that. Remind or Zoom, like what we're seeing here right now. So those are the things that you said, and I see in the chat that you brought up some other things that were not here. So now we're getting into the tools. Lots of tools. Any other tools that you're using that just, you know, popped into your mind, go ahead and type them in the chat. So we all have lots of tools. Lots of different tools. Me too, I had lots of different, oh, exciting tools. But I was like, I needed a framework. I needed a framework. I know what the research says, I know I have all these tools, but how can I do this? So let's organize these tools around a framework. The framework is by um, Dr. Robert Marzano. Maybe you've heard of him, maybe not. He's not specific to adult ed at all. He, write, he takes the research and puts it into these books that teach you how to teach with the research um, impacting how you teach. So as I was reading about teaching vocabulary, I came across his six-step process for teaching vocabulary. I'm like, that makes sense. And how, what are the different tools I can use for each? Now I have a framework. So his method is a direct method. So direct method of instruction. If you can type in the chat, what does that mean to you, a direct method? So direct instruction is not just here, read this text. If you, there's something you don't understand, use your dictionary. Good luck. No, this is picking the words that we're going to explicitly teach and taking students through six steps, explaining to them having them restate, having them show that they know what the word means, 
having them engage with the new words, having them discuss with the new words, having them play, okay? So it's not just leaving to chance that they're gonna pick up the words. Um, you know, we have great students. A lot of them have their dictionary and they're looking up words all the time, but some of them don't have the study skills and it's our job to teach them. So if we're taking them through these steps, we can make sure that we're giving them multiple exposures as well. Okay, so I confess, this is my best activity for teaching vocabulary. Old fashioned index cards. So you're thinking right now, what am I doing in this <laughs> webinar? But no, when we do some reading in my class, I've picked out those academic word lists or high frequency words, and then we make index cards. So how can I possibly do this online? That's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm thinking maybe I will make some sort of fillable PDF form or something. But this is what the research says is most effective. Christine, mm -hmm. what level? Well, what I'm level? teaching advanced ESL. So this would look a lot different if you're teaching beginning ESL, right? You would probably have a picture with the word, the sentence from the source, or an original sentence that the student writes about him or herself, right? And um, I'm going to come back to this in a bit, but if we're just giving them flashcards, it's not as effective for helping them retain the word as having them write it down themselves. So even if they're typing it somewhere, that's, that's, they're still having to produce this, this sort of you know, index card. So I'm gonna come back to that. But I used a lot of other tools. I do not use all of the tools you're gonna see today. No way, no way, okay? I'm just giving you a survey. So the first step is explaining to provide a student-friendly description, explanation, or example of the new word or term. So we can do that with online images. I heard someone say, oh, I love this site, New York Times. What is that? The, it's not picture of the day. Someone just said it in the chat. Um, that'd be a great way to bring up vocabulary, you know, to preview. So you could send students out. You, you show them you know, a picture of a word, but you send them out and they go take pictures and, and present to the class the next day. So how this might be online is you have students, let's say you're studying something, you have them go in a scavenger hunt around their house and take pictures and, and text to you and then you open up the pictures in Zoom and they talk about them or something. There are many picture dictionary websites that are excellent. So at the end, you'll see the, the URL and you'll get this sent to you. Um, I've collected the different ones um, on a website. Um, GIFs, comic strips, slideshows, or just making up a story. Sometimes I just get really creative and make up a, a story or using a current event that uses the vocabulary, okay? So I'm gonna go through some things, different um, tools that we can use to explain. Um, I think already uh, many of you use picture dictionaries. I just want to mention this one because this one's pretty cool. The Visual Dictionary Online by Miriam Webster. I don't know about you, um, when I taught a vocational ESL class, I. I still do this sometimes, help students write resumes. And for them to explain the jobs that they did in their country or they're doing here that are so unrelated to anything I know, I sometimes have trouble helping them because I don't know what their job duties were. I don't know the for their careers. So I just wanna show how specific this site is. They have astronomy, earth, plants and gardening, animal kingdom, human, I mean, lots of different categories. So I cho chose category of house and in there, let's say I have a HVAC, you know, student. They need to learn the words in English for heating, um, ventilation, air conditioning. Um, I'm gonna say that I had a student who, who was an architect. She was getting ready to transfer over into credit courses to try to get her, you know, um, accreditation or her, her ability to be certified to teach, to work as an architect. So here's where I could send her. Okay, frame. Within frame, I didn't realize there were so many words. Tie beam, rafter, ceiling joist. Okay, this, this would be very helpful for some of those students who are in very specific areas for their work and they need to learn the vocabulary. I just wanted to show that because I think it's a pretty cool site. There's so much there. I'm sure any of us could. And it has, vo it has audio too, so they can hear the words. 
we could explain things with emojis, right? So maybe you're teaching beginning ESL. I remember I used to have a poster when I taught beginning ESL. How are you feeling today? And, you know, had the different faces. So maybe I could, you know, make, do a screenshot using emoji keyboard online of some different faces before I teach emotions. Like, how do you think the first guy feels right here? How do you feel? Go ahead and type it in. And, you know, for more advanced students, we could really expand on that. Like, so if they say for the second emoji, if they say he's mad, what are other ways for saying mad? Embarrassed, wondering, shell-shocked, overwhelmed, surprised, oh. confused, oh. tired. Ah. See how you can get many different words for, from all your class on one emoji? So, you know, for the lower level students, you can help them. Their, their own classmates are helping them build the, the vocabulary. You could bring in idioms. So, you know, sometimes, what's an idiom for angry? Red okay. as a beat. Red as a beat. Frustrated. Blew his top. Hot under the collar. Lost his cool. Awesome. Awesome. So you can see something so simple as an emoji could be, be useful. Um, okay. This one. GIF Lingua, I guess it's, it was created for language teachers. I don't know. Um, so I just decided to check it out. Does anybody know what a GIF is? Or um, So I found this site. Let me just show you. You can create books there, but there's a lot of content there with GIFs. GIFs are those little, what's kind of like short little video clips, you know, um, people send them to you. It's just maybe a person, you know, cheering or something. So you can create books. This one is very three. This one is on very three. Kind of reminds me of our president, how he says very, very, very good. Maybe you could use instead of very, very, very good, um, some other word. Okay, so we have here very dangerous, perilous. So it gives you a little preview. And then as you go through, go to next at the bottom there. Make it a little bit bigger. Let's review these very strong verbs. Okay, one little thing there. These aren't verbs. But anyway, I just wanted to show you an example. These are adjectives, right? So then I go to next. Perplexed. He's very confused. So there, He's perplexed. There's a gif with perplexed, the, the new vocabulary word, and very confused. And you keep going. So it's like a little booklet. You could go search on there. Innovative. And Apple is a very creative company. It's innovative. Okay. Maybe she's British. She says innovative. I would say innovative. But it's, you know, it's got some use, I think. It, sometimes I'm trying to draw something on the board or trying to find a good Google image. And, you know, certain things you just can't really put into images that are great. Um, like Giphy, we could have with gifts.com or Giphy, students can create their own gifts. Wouldn't that be fun? So I looked at Giphy and I was imagining like, what if I wanted to teach different ways of movement? Usually I'm in the classroom and I'm like, hey, look at me, I'm walking fast, you know, but maybe I could find some gifts. So I went on here and I created a favorites list after, after I made my account. Let's see if it's going to let me go to my favorites. I go to my favorites and I made a collection of gifts for different ways of moving. So what do you call, what do you call this gif in the top left? She is doing what? Hurdling. In the middle top, what did the cat do? He jumped, right? But the parrot... Looks like a wrestling move. Yeah. And the parrot is not really jumping. What do you call that kind of jumping? Dancing. Okay. I would say hopping. hopping. Mm -hmm. And then you see the basketball player? What is that kind of movement? Skipping. Yes. How would you describe these gentlemen in the, in the middle? They're walking... What else? What's Strolling, another word? Walking Strolling, fast. Walking fast. Walking fast. Walking briskly. Then you see these um, two folks at the beach. What is their body movement? Jogging. Jogging. And then we see a very old picture um, of what? I can't remember the actress's name. How is she walking? Strutting. Strutting. Sashay. 
sashaying catwalk catwalk i like the word sauntering then we see forrest gump how is how is his movement he is running running run 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 dashing sprinting dashing and then i don't know this guy's name but he's a what is that sport called he the, the guy there i don't remember his name what is he doing mcgregor connor mcgregor eh, not necessarily in this gif yeah. i would say he's Glowing. swaggering swaggering definitely okay so you can see how you could possibly use gifs okay how many of you know think link thing link thing link you can create an account you can upload any type of document like a picture okay and then on each different on different parts of the picture or whatever document you upload you can add text you can link to a video you can link to any website it's pretty cool let me show you house so i'm thinking of different let's see if i'm if i'm teaching anatomy that would be a great use of this it, i think there are just many different things you could do so it's it's like an sort of more interactive than just you know giving a dictionary page or a picture dictionary so here's the house you see the spots when i mouse over them i see okay this is called a roof this is called a chimney this is called an attic this is the bedroom and then when i get to the bathroom there's a video so i'm going to show the bathroom one christy this is pg right it is PG. I, I did you. preview it and I highly recommend always look at different YouTube videos before you show them to students. Hello and welcome to English Tonight. Tonight we will learn bathroom vocabulary. Toilet paper. Okay, so we'll stop, stop there because that's a big topic, right? So anyway, you can link anything. You create your account and you create materials but you can also just go there and and um log in and look for materials like this one i did not make it but if i were teaching beginning esl i could use it i could definitely use it i would just copy this link and send it to my students and they could practice that's called thing link okay i don't know about you i don't really like to see myself on video but i i do make you know different vocabulary presentations so a lot of times what I do is make a narrated PowerPoint slideshow I narrate it and then I export it as a video so you can see on the on the left to narrate a PowerPoint slideshow you just go to the slideshow record slideshow and you start talking and click at the end you save it and then when you go to finish it you go to file export create as a video and it saves it all together as a video that you can email to your students you can upload to google drive or you can post on youtube whatever you like that would be some other way to explain vocabulary you could also do a screencast so there's jing very popular one is screencast-o-matic and that's basically recording what you see on your computer screen okay um, Loom is awesome, I have to say, and there's an article about it um, in OTAN's website. Put the link here, you'll get that at the end of this. Um, Loom, you can just screencast, just show what's on your desktop, but you could also, if you wanted to, you could put your, your face talking. So for the, you know, for language learners, maybe we need to show our face so they can see how our mouth moves so they know how to pronounce words. So it reminds me a lot of, if you ever know anyone or if you, yourself are interested in gaming a lot of youtube videos have gamers screencasting their games and then themselves talking so that's loom that could be a way to explain any other ways that you would use technology to explain new vocabulary online quizzes if you're using um an lms a learning management system like google classroom edmodo moodle canvas you could have online quizzes Poll everywhere. Poll everywhere. Memory okay. card games. So I think that you're getting into the next step because this is just the teacher explaining. Okay. So let's go on. Now we need our students to restate. They need to use the word. 
okay? So they need to use it describing it, explaining it, or an example in their own words. On Padlet, one of you posted the personal, you know, personalization. What do we know most about in this world? We know the most about ourselves. So if we can relate a new vocabulary word to our lives, we're going to remember it better. So we could have students do cell phone videos with voice recordings or take a little video recording themselves saying a sentence using the vocabulary word, slideshow, poster, and so on. I go back to my old-fashioned index cards. Um, so I have students look up de definitions from Merriam-Webster Learner's Dictionary. It's the one I like the best. Why the other online dictionaries? So let's say I had to look up the word happiness. It will say the state of being happy. That doesn't help the student, you know? So this one is written in simple terms. The definitions are easy. So I have students write the word, the pronunciation, the part of speech. Again, this would not be beginning ESL. Um, related words in the word family. They write the original sentence from the text. They, they look up the def definition. It, a lot of dictionaries like this one give a sample sentence. So you have them um, write another example. Thesaurus.com is where they can find synonyms and antonyms. And I think someone already mentioned Word Hippo. Word Hippo is pretty robust. It's like dictionary, thesaurus, everything in one. And I like to go there sometimes for when I help students with a sentence frame for writing their own sentence. Because sometimes they can't think of something. But I always have it be about I or my, you know, something like that. And um, I go to Word Hippo to get ideas if I just can't think of a, a way to make a sentence frame for students to write a sentence about themselves. I'd also like to mention Youglish. It looks like YouTube, right? I'm not going to go there, but you can go there later. Um, what you do is you go there and you type in a word and it shows you all these um, clips from videos on YouTube with whoever is in the video saying the word and a caption. So that would be, I don't I haven't even explored the possibilities. There are lots of po possibilities for using Youglish, especially when students need to write an example sentence or their own sentence. Picture. Okay, again, for ESL, if they were, you know, the beginning levels, they could draw their own picture, right? Um, sometimes, though, it's hard to think of a sentence about yourself with some words. Um, let me think of the example that um, happened to me in class. Distortion. The word in our text was distortion. I can't think of a sentence I can write about myself using distortion. So I drew a little picture. We all, you know, in my area, there's the Del Mar Fair every summer. And so they have roller coasters and fun rides in this. And I, you know, so I bring up, you know, sometimes when you go to a fair or something, there's um, a room with the funny shaped mirrors. And when you look in it, your, your body, you see a reflection that is, has distor distortion. And I draw a little picture that helped them remember. I couldn't think of any other sentence I could write, except for maybe when I try and close and the mirror, gives, you know, it's not a real distortion. So that's, you know, what we can help students do Christy, to build. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Um, sure. Could you um, repeat what sentence from source is? So if, if I've chosen a text that we're going to read in class, so we read it in class, or maybe I decide to front load the vocabulary teaching first, but to keep it within the context, in this reading passage, let's find the sentence that contained that new vocabulary word and copy it. That's what that means. Sentence from the original source, whether it's a video or a text. Okay. Well, we probably won't have for the next few months the luxury of having a classroom where we can do a word wall. I don't see this as much in ESL or adult ed, but you know, anybody in K through 12, they spend so much time on these beautiful word walls. Other, you know, most of us in adult ed, we often have to share a classroom. So we could use Padlet. We could go into Padlet teachers and create a wall. We make the account, but students don't have to. And we could either do it like this. We could assign everybody in the class the same word where they're entering different, um, 
sentences about themselves, pictures, video, or we could assign different students different words. It's following the index card type of thing. Um, and so the example I have posted right here that you see is not from Padlet, but it's from Lino. And so the word is method. And every student, every different student had the same word. And someone put in a video, the method for beginners. I think it's yoga. And then method, way to do something. My mother taught me the correct method for making tamales. And they put a picture. So you could do it like that. That would be interactive. And with Padlet, this one is Lino, but with Padlet, you can download as a PDF the Padlet wall. Of course, videos wouldn't really, you know, be interactive on a, on a paper, but um, lots of possibilities for that. Um, we're not going to try this because too many people, okay? But you can come back to this. Um, and I have here a wall that if you wanted to try posting again, um, you can click there and you can try it. There is um, an app for different devices. And if you want to learn how to use Padlet, this Padlet tour takes you step by step through creating a Padlet wall. Language learners, this site linked, um, it was built for language instructors. Okay. Let me show you a sample. Anybody, I, I think a couple of you did say that you teach citizenship. So it's free. You go in and you create a class. And not that one. That's my vowels one. Okay. You select your class. And here's one that I just made to practice. Citizen, citizenship interview. Okay. So it's, it's still within vocabulary, but it has lots of different uses for EL civics and so on. So once you create a class, you can put in text, you can put in videos, you can put in pictures, you can write questions in text, or you can record your voice. So that's what I did here. I just recorded my voice asking some of the 100 questions for citizenship. What is the supreme law of and the land? And you can have students type or record their voices. So you see the microphone, they would come in here and record their voices answering the questions. So that could be a way for you to get students to use vocabulary speaking about themselves. When, when you go in there, you can also then give feedback to students, um, written or voice feedback. So if you haven't tried Linked, you should really check it out, language teachers especially. So we're gonna take a break in just a minute. Have you heard of Flipgrid? So mostly no. Um, I love to do video projects with my students. They all have phones. And um, so one time I decided to make a video project and it was about, you know, idioms. And then they would, they would cr create a little dialogue and videotape themselves, maybe with a classmate, you know, reading these dialogues. And then it was pure chaos because I was getting, you know, some of their videos by email, some by text. It was just, it was pure chaos. The different level of quality of the videos, it was, it was a mess. It, it was great. It was a great project, but Flipgrid would have been a much better choice. I just didn't know about it then. I know about it now, and now I really love it and use it. Flipgrid is like synchronous, asynchronous communication. There are multiple ways. There's an app. There are multiple ways. You go in and you create a grid. You can be on video. I prefer not, so I don't put myself. I just put some questions. And then students can open the app on their phone or um, go to Flipgrid and enter the code that you give them. And then they just look for this green button and they record themselves on video. They can comment on each other's videos. So you could have them introduce themselves, say their vocabulary word that you assign them, its definition, and say something about themselves using the vocabulary word. So I'm gonna pause for about five minutes. I'm gonna let you try this. If you want to go to Flipgrid and type in this code, or if you have your phone, you can open a QR code reader and scan this code. So let's take about a five minute break. If you want to try this out, you can. I'm going to put on a quick five-minute timer. Okay, and Christy, while mm -hmm. I still got you here, 
don't go anywhere yet. Um, do know. students need to have their own account for linked or do they join a teacher's account? They join yeah, the teacher just shares the link and um, the students don't need to create an account. And do you have an opinion on using Flipgrid versus VoiceThread? Well, VoiceThread, um, as I recall. And they need a code for the. Yeah, okay. Oh, yes, let me put that back. Um, VoiceThread, I don't know if it's changed. I, I started with that at one point and I really loved it, but then it is like, okay, you need to pay now. And I could only have three grids, whereas Flipgrid does not seem to have that limitation. It's still all free. Go to Flipgrid. And then when you get there, all you need to do is enter this code. The app is free. I have students install the app on their phones. Um, and then you see the instructions once you get there. So you're just looking for that green button. You click on it. You're going to say your name, say your vocabulary word, any word, okay? Define it, and then say a sentence about yourself using the vocabulary word. And just to let you know, I'm, I set it up so that I get email whenever there's a new um, response on the Flipgrid. So that's kind of nice that you get that. You can, you, there are different settings. You can set it not to do that. You could have a daily digest. Folks, the QR code is actually on the screen, so you can point your phone towards it. And the QR code reader might ask you to back away a little bit if your screen is really bright. Um, but the QR code is actually on the screen that, that Christy is showing. And I forgot to mention, you do need to log in with Google or Microsoft. You'll have to make a Gmail. <laughs> I don't think it gives an option. Someone asks, I'm doing this on my phone. Are you going to be able to see it? Yep. So it's like automatic. Once you, you know, submit, it's there. You may have noticed that it asks you if you want to create a selfie. You can put in all kinds of funny things. Um, so there are, let me see, where is it? There, there's the option to put like a hat and different silly things on top. So students always love that, put hearts all around their faces and stuff. And, you know, personally, I don't like to be on video that much. So you could, you could tell students, you could put on some sunglasses, you could put on a disguise, um, you could put an orchid like Jennifer has. Oliver, this is from a past workshop, covered his face, in fact. So you see, it's not that hard to figure out. You just tell students to, to put in a code. So if they, if they install the app on their phone, then they open the app and it says, what's your code? And you will always see your code in the top left. Um, so it's not that hard. I think this would be a great way for students to communicate if you're not gonna go with Zoom or other like synchronous tool. Okay, so you can see everybody, I won't play all your videos, but you can come back and look at each other's videos. Um, but do you think you would like this? What do you think? Do you think your students would like Flipgrid? I think it's one way that we can definitely keep our community in our classrooms that we work so hard to create and that we know helps us retain students so you can see they just pop up as they're posted okay yeah and when you when you log in it asks you google or microsoft okay. that's the only two options that i that it gives so as far as i know they have to have one of those maybe there's some other way but there is but okay thank you we'll, we'll do that after you finish okay. your presentation okay. all right so <clears throat> That's Flipgrid. Obviously, if you're teaching conversation, this could be great, great way to assess pronunciation, et cetera. Okay. Any other ways for students to restate new vocabulary? So it basically, they're giving the definition explanation. That is the second step. Third step is show. Um, my colleague and friend, Susan Gare, I'm sure that a lot of you know her, um, she presented this before when I could not, um, you know, 
travel and um, she she preferred to change this step to be called construct I agree but um, I wanted to be true to the man who invented this con you know this method but this is where we ask students to construct a picture a symbol or graphic representation of the term it may seem not important to us, but there are those students who need to draw something or do something kinesthetic or to have some visual that they created themselves. How many of you know Canva? Not Canvas, but Canva. Okay, I love it. Oh my gosh, it's such a cool site and so many beautiful templates. So what I did is um, I haven't had students use Canva for vocabulary necessarily. So I was thinking how I could have students use Canva. There are so many options, but I was thinking how about just an infographic? Let's say that we're learning the stages of life, like baby, newborn, infant, infancy, toddler, what toddle means. So I just made this as an example. This is one of their templates and I just went in and changed the words, put in different pictures and so on. So infographics are, are really like, everywhere now, right? That's probably what our reading, what most of our texts will look like in the future, if not, you know, already, is that there's image, because we can do this, we can combine imagery with words more. I'm just gonna show you really quick Canva for those few of you who maybe have never looked at it before. Oh my goodness, it's such beautiful templates for posters, for logos. That's actually how I've used it before. I had students create a personal logo. Videos, presentations, flyers, cards, infographics, business cards, resumes, brochures, invitations, desktop wallpaper, book cover, certificate, menu. Hey, when you're teaching food, ESL student, our teachers, have them go on and create a menu. Wouldn't that be cool? That'd be fun. Letterhead, CD covers, ID cards, newsletters, calendars, posters, postcards, labels, announcements, gifts, or okay, you can see within each of these categories, there are so many beautiful templates, and it's so Chrissy, easy is this to use. free? Completely free. Yep. So that's called Canva. So you could have them create an infographic or maybe a menu or a postcard or whatever. Um, Pictochart and Info, um, Infogram are also two other sites that help you. They have templates where you can create infographics. So that's, that could be one way students show. Christine? I didn't, yes, go ahead. Sorry, this is Anthony. Just a quick thing about Canva. Um, yes, you can create a free account. However, All right. um, you don't have as many um, free options on the templates. Like if yes, you want that's true. Some of them are very cheap, though, like a dollar or whatever. But, I mean, you, you have a range. You just don't have, like, a huge range of templates. So. That's but true. But you have, there's still so much to work with. Yeah. I would just say, um, yeah, I forgot to mention that. Thank you for bringing that up. When I was looking for – you search for pictures within, and I've kept looking and – Pictures that had a little crown, I couldn't use because that's premium and you have to pay for. It. So some of the pictures, you know, you may not get the exact, you know, beautiful picture that they offer you unless you pay. But I was still pretty, you know, satisfied with what I could do for free. All right. Yeah. I can't think of a lot of different ways for students to visually or graphically show the definitions of new vocabulary using technology. Maybe you're more creative in this area. Can you think of other ways that students could show? And we're talking about visuals and graphics. Any ideas there? Type in the chat if take you photos. Can help you. Photos, yeah. Taking their own pictures. Mm hmm Act it and film it on Flipgrid. Ah, nice. Google Explore image. Nice. Photos. They can upload their own photos to Canvas. So we've got a lot of photos and images. Yeah. Uh, find pictures. Paint, draw, sculptures. Yeah. I mean, sometimes Pretty we don't give shows. our students a chance to show their creative sides. So, you know, something so simple as making a slideshow on PowerPoint, sometimes I thought, oh my gosh, you really got an eye for design. I had no idea. And I've had students who, you know, created this beautiful artwork. So this could be a, a time for those sh students to really shine. Um, a quick question back to Canva. Is it uh, possible on phones? There is an app. Yes, there is. I, I installed it. I haven't used it yet on my phone, but there is an app. So 
you know, Marzano is showing with these six steps that we are hitting all the different preferred learning styles as well. I think that's important to remember. Okay, we're coming close to the end. The next step is to engage. And this is what probably all of us are really good at already, right? Because adult teachers, teachers of adults are among the best teachers. I know this. I've seen many of of these teachers throughout California. So good at these classroom communicative activities where students are engaged, right? We're really good at that. So I know you already know about flashcards and here are some, you know, for ESL, some different sites that you can find really high quality print flashcards. I put a little star next to ESL library because it is not free, but um, we got a subscription for all the teach program and Wow, that's got a lot of materials there. If you haven't ever, you know, gone there, maybe ask for a free trial. And I, I have to say, you can you can download a lot of stuff in in fifteen days free trial. Um, you know, they could also they could or you could, but it's always better when the students do this because then they're learning the technology. You could have the students create flashcards in Word, PowerPoint, Google Slides, maybe. Um, through Google Sheets, um, but digital flashcards are probably what we're gonna have students do more of, right? Because um, they have their phones. So Flippity, if you go to OTAN um, and you do a search, you will find an entry on Flippity that tells you how to do that. Flashcard stash is there and flashcard machine, just in case they're, they're or give you some other options because I know a lot of you know Quizlet. Quizlet you know, which was really cool. I have my word list, but I've gone on there and done searches and someone took the time to put the whole academic word list, not all in one, you know, card deck, but the whole word list in groups. So if you later click this link, it's all there. So you could, you know, if you're doing remote teaching, you could just, hey, here's something extra. I think you need to le learn the academic word list words. Go to Quizlet and do each group of, of, um, of flashcards and then let me know when you're done and I'll send you a quiz or something. Um, if some of you, if you have, you know, if you know Quizlet, you may not have used it in a while, like I hadn't used it in a little while, and now you can put in diagrams. So this is Susan Gare's um, card set. Okay, I guess I have to read, okay. Um, so she was teaching about parts of the car, and so she did, she uploaded this image and then it reminds me a lot of thing link right so then she was able to put labels on each part of this so students can see it um, of course down here they can hear the words in just one section of the just one item okay and then um, they could do the matching so just to show you what it looks like, because I'm sure you're all familiar when it's just a list of words with definitions. So here, let's see, okay, okay, horn. I have to drag it. I think they have to drag, yeah, okay. Gas pedal, I think it's this one. Passenger seat right here. Gear shift right here. Um, so you can see that could be fun. I'm thinking of our students who are at home, just like me, I have my kids like just behind me. This could be something fun to do for the family. We could be reaching out into families and creating family literacy and digital literacy. They could play games on Quizlet. So Quizlet has that option. And I know a lot of you know Learning Chocolate, but if you're a beginning ESL teacher and you haven't heard of it, you better check it out. I want to mention this because... Um, this book is so, it really made me rethink a lot of things that I do in my classroom. Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. This is all kinds of research, again, on how we learn and remember better. So in this book, they talk about some different things that we need as teachers to consider and to put into Im implementation. Learning sticks with us when we're learning something new, when there's effort that we have to make. So we need to create effortful learning. So that's not picking out words and teaching that words that they already probably know, but effort learn, 
effortful learning sticks with us. We need to include a lot of retrieval practice. What does that mean? The flashcards, repetition. We need interleaved and varied practice. So not the same flashcards over and over and over, but maybe a different tool or different activity. And interleaved means, for example, I have this flashcard set and I study and I study and I study. Now I'm going on to the next flashcard set. That doesn't mean I forget the first. So you know, recycling is another way to say that. Um, we should include frequent low stakes testing because testing, for us, it's the formative, right, to see what we need to teach again and, and um, improve. But also for the students, it shows students their weaknesses. So in this book, they talk about a college professor who had two tests a year. So he had his midterm and his final. And he, the, the attendance was terrible. Students only showed up. They, they saw in the syllabus when the test was going to be. So he decided to have weekly low stakes quizzes and students were filling the classroom. So that's something to think about. Elaboration gives meaning to new material by connecting to what we already know. So not just memorizing a list of words and definitions, but it goes to that um, personalizing and writing and speaking about yourself, connecting to your own life. Um, putting previously known I'm sorry, putting previous knowledge into a larger context. And then a nod to Carol Dweck, if you have heard of her. Um, her work is on growth mindset and how that relates to elasticity of the brain, that we can always learn. And making mistakes and correcting our own mistakes helps us build bridges to advanced learning. So based on that book, someone in England, I believe it was, created this course site called Memrise. Have you heard of it? Um, I'm going to show you a couple of courses. You do need to create an account. So you could actually do some searching in here and you could use a word list. It's actually more than a word list. It's, it's, like, it's like Quizlet on steroids, okay? Um, you could find something that someone else created and you can ask your students to make an account and to study that that group of words or that course. So this one I found English Visual Dictionary, and um, this would be for beginning ESL. They have the human body, human organs, emotions, vegetables, fruit berries, and nuts. I mean, it, it's got all the categories of different words you would find in a picture dictionary, okay? So I'm just gonna take a look so you can see how it implements or puts into practice this research. So let's look at the human body. Okay, so it, it's like Quizlet that it has the little list here with pictures. It can be pictures or text, right? And then the student goes here, learn these words. Head. Okay, so now if I want to, this site uses something they call MEMS, not memes, you know what memes are, but MEMS, little memory devices. So you can go here, as a student, they could go here and they could pick. Oh, that's a baby head. So these other students have uploaded as their own mems but ways to remember the word. So maybe they want to put a picture of their own kid, you know, that would help them remember. Oh, that one, yeah, that might help me remember. Mm, okay, or they can upload their own image that will help them remember this word, okay? So I'll just pick one of the other ones. Okay, I'll just pick that one. Okay, then I go next. Hair. Hair. Okay, I, I, I think I know hair. I don't need a mem. Oh my gosh, it, it's quizzing me right away. Remember that 30 seconds? It was less than 30 seconds. So I have, I'm quizzed right away. So here's the head. Okay. Head. Now I go on. Face. Okay. Oh, so soon. You really have to pay attention with this one. So they can either drag the letters up or they can type it in. I'll just type it in. So that's an example. That is your whole vocabulary course right there. Hair. So that's one of them. Let me show you a more advanced one. Hair. Okay. Um, do you have to make an account in Memrise? Yeah, you do. Yes. Is it yeah, freemium yeah. premium or is it? Um, you know what? It looks like it's free. I haven't 
I haven't done anything that's asked me to pay. I haven't gone on and created a full course myself. I've mostly borrowed from other teachers, but let's just get the academic English one just so you can see what it looks like at a higher level. So it has a leaderboard. So like students go in and take quizzes and you know, they can see how other people are doing. So this is, I believe, the academic word list. So I'm gonna start at the beginning. Oh yeah, see the words are much harder. Oh, and there's a lot more. Wow, oh my goodness, there's a lot there. Okay, I'm gonna learn these words. Abstract. Mm, okay, maybe I want a mem. Abstract art. Yeah. Well, someone even put a word, not realistic. Okay, maybe I'll upload a picture for abstract that I prefer. Christy, can you create your own word set so the words are relevant? Yes. That's the thing, you create a teacher account. I'm just showing you other teachers lists or courses, but you go in, you create your word list much like you would on Quizlet. And then it creates all these, you know, the audio is created and it creates all these exercises for you. It's pretty Are there cool. American English courses in Memorize? Okay, let me show you. So I'm gonna go out of this one. I think you get the idea. Um, let me show you what all there is, okay. I'm going to go to courses. So you can, hey, you got some time on your hands? Do you want to learn Italian or Korean? Um, so they have lots of language courses here, okay? So there's categories of languages, arts and literature. I want to show you history and geography. Within history and geography, hey, citizenship teacher, civics, the U.S. Constitution. Oh, let me see. Is this the one I wanted? Okay, let me try it. Uh, this even has videos, uh, the legislative brand. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through it, but there is a ton of stuff there, tons of courses. And yeah, and I'm, that, that's kind of a segue, sorry. <laughs> sure, go ahead. <laughs> there are different tools for each step of the process. Can you maybe recommend the same two or three that could be used in each process? Let me, let's hold that thought to the end. Yeah, Holding. that's a good, um, yeah. Bring that back at the end. I have my recommendations and favorites, but every course is different. Every teaching situation is different. And you, again, need to know your students what access to technology, what's going to be too hard for them and will frustrate them and, you know, make them leave. And what would be, start simple. What would be something you already know and then what's one new thing you're going to try, okay? So um, we talked about QR codes. Um, if you wanted to make maybe um, a sheet that you, like a Word document that you email to students with your voice, of course there are other ways of doing this like podcasting, okay? But um, what you could do if you wanted to make flashcards or you could have students make flashcards and they, you want them to hear your voice saying a sentence, you can make a QR code of a voice recording. So this voice recorder is free online. You, you push uh, record, you say something, you push stop, and then it gives you a URL. And then you go to QR code generator, go there, paste in the URL. I'll just show you what that looks like. So you would choose URL, paste in uh, the website URL, choose what you want your QR code to look like over here and download it. And then you can copy and paste it onto a Word document or just send it in an email, okay? So I don't know, I think QR codes are kind of a untapped resource. Um, yeah, that's, that's something you could do to engage students as well. Um, all the research says that we should have students doing things like comparing and contrasting and categories, categorizing, classifying, labeling, diagramming, sorting. Um, I really like Read, Write, Think, but those are primarily print materials, but you could have students do brainstorming and things like that on Poplet app or bubble.us. I mentioned this for one day when we go back to the classroom. Um, this is from Learn, Click, Close, Creator. The research says that one way for students to really, one of the best ways for students to show us that they have understood and can use a word besides writing about themselves is these clothes where you take out the keywords and you create a word bank. 
Um, I'm sure a lot of you have done this. I've done this a million times where I copy in and I'm on Microsoft Word and I take out a word and space, 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 put in the line and then, you know, somehow try to remember what word I took out, put in a word, oh, I forget what word and then there are nine words and 10 questions, I don't know. So this one, the free part of learn, click, close creator, you paste in a text and you just click on the words you want to remove. It puts the line for you and it creates the word bank for you and you get a PDF that you can um, download and print. Okay, so that's, that's free, that part. Learn, click, cro uh, close creator, if you pay, um, it will also open up things to creating quizzes and discussion boards and so on and getting statistics on individual students. But that part you have to pay for. Do you know Wiser Me? Anybody say yes if you do? No, no. Yes. Okay. Heard of it. No, yes. If, so no, um, no. I don't want to offend K through 12, but I know the purpose of giving worksheets a lot of times in elementary school um, is to get students into the habit of doing homework, right? And those worksheets are not super motivating, you know, right? But Wiser Me is like a multimedia worksheet. If you've ever heard of hyperlinks, it reminds me a lot of that. So I'm gonna show you two quick examples. Free, you make an account, you, sh you sh assign students, you check the answers, it's free. Okay, so let me show you a couple of examples. <clears throat> this one, there's not a lot of people in adult ed using this yet, because I did a search and I couldn't really find a lot for adult ed, but I found this one. So if you're ASE, this could be an example. English 9 vocabulary unit 1, so this must be high school, okay? So they did some reading, and these were some of the words. Okay, so she, the teacher first created a matching. Notoriety, uh, known for a bad reason, right? So you just kind of drag, okay? Condescend, I know that's something about, something bad, let's see, patronizing. So I'm imagining she's taught the, the, the synonyms as well. So that's one activity. Um, synonym, so we got multiple choice. Fortitude, I know that means uh, bravery, okay? Oh, gave me a check, instant feedback. Choose the picture that shows a person with notoriety. It's not Mother Teresa, I think it's Biggie. Oh, I was right. Okay, our, our romance language students will know that fort means, not weak, I, that was not my answer. Strong, means strong. An anonym of inarticulate is articulate, but probably inarticulate, okay. So you can see then there's also, they could type in a paragraph, a sentence, an essay. They re could record their voice. They've, there's clothes, there's so many things here. That's one example. Let me show you the other example real quick. This one, a teacher created. So when I create my account, I can go find something a teacher created and I can copy it and I can change it. So this one is English language arts. So human body and its functions. You can see the picture she uploaded was, you know, um, stock photo, because it's got this watermark, but okay, so I'm going to click there oh, to write in what that is. I don't know if it's hair or head. So they have to write in the part of the face and then go down and there's matching. Okay, I didn't know hair had an extreme function, but we comb it. Not these days, but used to. Internal organs. Oh, don't even go there. I don't know what those things do. Um, which the okay so anyway you see it's got lots of possibilities. Christy, how do the students get to it? Do you does okay. the teacher share the link or do they yes. have to log in? Yes. Um, yes. The teacher will need to go in and create or copy something, and then they will share the link with the students. Do the students need to log in? Yeah, they will. Otherwise, we won't know how individually they did. Yes, so they will need to create an account. Do they okay. have to create an account using Google or Microsoft? No. Okay. I don't think so. That's a good question. Um, premium is only three dollars a month. You could create a whole online course, I think, with with WiserMe. Okay, so that's WiserMe. 
Um, I love shared Google Slides. I don't know about you. I just love to students putting their work together in one place. It's easy for me to find. So I got this idea from TESOL. They have a book, New Ways in Teaching Vocabulary, the 2014 edition, put in lots of different tech ideas. But you know that you should never publish a book on tech tools because they change. So a lot of, a lot of what's there in the book is, is not really relevant because the websites are not there or whatever. But you could assign students to contribute to a shared Google slideshow, or they could use Animoto or P Powtoon or any of those others. Um, and you could ask them to def define a word, you know, going through all the steps that I showed you on my index card. Um, so let me show you an example from a previous training with teachers. I wanted to do this today, but Melinda and me, it probably wouldn't work out so well with so many, I might break the internet or something. But I have, I have the directions here. They can put in YouTube videos. So I want them to use thesaurus.com. They can draw and so on. And so this was what a teacher in LA, when I went there, he put in a video, his word was initiative. He put the phonetic spelling the best he could and so on. This was Jennifer, her word was alleviate. So this is a word she had taught recently. And then she put the example sentence, the young man used an Ike to alleviate the pain from his sunburn. This person was really good, <laughs> really good at, <laughs> at, um, at Google Slides. And so um, she put a background image and there's our present offering everybody hamburgers. So then what I do is I go in and I put students' names and I just copy the slide a whole bunch of times and I put in one slide for each student. So that's, you know, one way you could have students be doing the work. And then you could, if you're doing a Zoom conference or something, you could open this up and each student is going to present their slide. If you think that would be something you would like to do, when you get this slideshow in your email, if you click right there, there's a template. You just choose make a copy. Okay. And Christy, do you have any suggestions of any sites specifically for the teachers who teach technology and computer applications? For teaching the vocabulary? I, I would think so because that's okay. what this work webinar is about. <laughs> yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, there's like Google Digital Skills. If you just go to OTAN's website and you you do a search, you're going to find a lot there. I can try to show you when we get done. Um, but otherwise, if you're teaching vocabulary for computer classes, there's got to be a lot online that you can find. I'm, I'm quite sure there is. Um, I don't know if you're using Zoom, or I don't know if you're using Canvas. I noticed that um, I taught a computer class last year. And I went into Canvas Commons, and there are a, there's a lot of content there that you could borrow. But I don't know if that answers your question. Probably not. Okay, beginning ESL, we, you know, some of you maybe use side by side, and there's those cute little dialogues with the grammar and stuff. But why don't we have students writing their original dialogues using the vocabulary and or the grammar that we're teaching. So there are a lot of sites to make digital movies. You could do PowerPoint or Google Slideshow with callouts. Um, you could use phrase out, uh, phrase it to put callouts or speech bubbles. Um, I included a video um, in, it, with our with our requirement to stay at home. It might be kind of hard, but students can create videos with their family. Wouldn't that be a great way to really, uh, you know, have family literacy going on where they're working together as a family to, to write a, um, a dialogue and creating a funny video or something? Um, comic strips. There is Storyboard That, which you do need to pay for, but I believe it's a 30-day free trial. So uh, when I sign it to my students, like, make an account. But you don't have to put any credit card in number in to make an account. So once the trial's done, you're done, right? If you want to use it again in the future, use a different email. Make Belief has been around for a long time. I, the man who has this website is amazing, Bill Zimmerman. If you go there, he has all kinds of different teaching tools and templates and ideas. Um, but this is an example. 
that um, another group of teachers created. They were, theirs was more about idioms, vocabulary, but you could create a comic strip. It's really easy, different characters. They can print it out. They can, it can be emailed. It's really fun. Any other ways for students to engage with the new vocabulary using tech? Type in the chat. And we're coming to the end. Pretty soon here, folks. I imagine that you have some ideas. Melinda, Quizlet anything? Live. Yeah. Padlet. Make yes. belief is free or pay? Question free. mark. Okay, free. Free, 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 free. Yes, Make everything love Quizlet Live. Except for when I point out that it's not. Yeah. Most yeah. apps okay. actually out there in the world will have a freemium version for a limited time or you uh -huh. so many bells and whistles and then if you go premium, it'll give you the rest. So, And, you know, I'm on lots of different listservs and I've been bombarded with all these lists of free resources. It's, it's overwhelming, but a lot of the paid, you know, um, premiums are, are free for us teachers for a while. So that's really, we're in a good time for this. So the, the five is discussed. So we've done a lot of intro thinking and creating using vocabulary, but they need to interact with others. So I, I often, you know, write the conversation questions myself, trying to think of a way for students to talk about themselves using the vocabulary words. So this is an example. But it, I think it's valuable to have students write the question. Actually, I want to do that more. You know, since I'm teaching, I tell them, okay, you're going to be in this group, and I want you to answer in a complete sentence. And you have to use that vocabulary word. It's not going to stick with you. So that's when I do face-to-face. -face. Um, but what we could do is we could have students write questions and interview their families, call their family members or friends on the phone, and survey and graph the results. They could do this on Excel. I don't know, know Excel, so I wouldn't even feel very comfortable with that. They could create a Google form for the survey. They could then take the results from the Google form, and if you've used Google Forms, you know it creates a Google Sheet. Um, I just include this one because it's free and online, create a graph. It says kids, but I used this once, I really liked it, because students have to think about how they're going to graph the information. Are they gonna use a bar chart? And this is what we call a certain type of literacy. I'm going to show you this website of Kathy Schrock. She is an ed tech guru. She presents a lot. I saw her at Q once, if you're, any of you are familiar with Q. Um, sorry, let me get this the right size. She says, nowadays there are 13 literacies actually. 13 literacies, digital global data, visual critical civic, traditional media historical, economic information tool. That's where we're at right here today, teachers. What tool is right for the activity? So that's tool literacy, information and health literacy. Oh my goodness, 13. So what type would it be to think to graphically represent data? What would that be? Anybody? Nobody's typing yet. Well, maybe they maybe they left. <laughs> um, no, I think that would here. probably. You're still um, there? Not sure. Chrissy, I'm, I'm going to interject myself in here just a little bit because you sure. are starting to drop some uh, packets, which mean, and that's why the video, the audio is going every okay. once in a while. So I'm just letting you know that. Thank you. And we okay. do have an answer finally. Data visual. Yes, could be both exactly. Um, so that could be something. Um, other asynchronous, you know, what we already talked about, Flipgrid. For written discussions, using vocabulary to answer questions that you ask. Discussion boards, each LMS has that. If you not use LMS, like Google Classroom or something, For You Motion is, is free. It looks like this. I haven't used it. You could try it. You could use a blog, a wiki, or so on. And what I want to show you real quickly is if you've ever taken a course, for sure you have engaged in discussion board this. 
um, it's amazing. Some students in our classes who never speak, sometimes they really come to life. I love, uh, this is a discussion board I had um, a few years ago with my advanced ESL class. We were working on phrasal verbs. And I think it's really important to be very clear about what the expectations are. So I have sort of a rubric and I tell them how to respond to their classmates. So I say, you have to post and you have to reply to at least two classmates posts. So I just, I'm gonna scroll just to show you how long this monster got. It was one weekend. So we, Wednesday, I told them what to do. And then when I looked here on Monday, they, they were putting in pictures and videos. I, this thing goes on and on. This is a lot of writing they did to each other. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I mean, I'm only halfway through, right? So um, I think that's something that's very common that we should definitely be doing for remote instruction to make sure our students are connecting with each other. Again, Flipgrid, if you have Canvas, Canvas audio submissions, there's a little record media thing if you're using Canvas. Um, Google Hangouts, FaceTime, Google Duo, Zoom. I mean, that's the next best thing to actually being together in, in a real classroom, right? Is, is some synchronous um, communication. Any other ways that you can think of to have students discuss using new vocabulary? Okay, we're gonna go on. In Zoom, uh, there's, yes. I think they're starting to nap. <laughs> I know, we're almost Rely done on folks. WhatsApp, breakout rooms. They could use Flipgrid for that one too. Write dialogues with each other. Okay, School all right. Share doc, okay. So we're on the last step and I think a lot of you have already been um, gamifying your classroom. The funny thing is Marzano says this is the step that we cannot, should not leave out. Isn't that interesting? Um, because when you're having fun, you're not so inhibited and you're not restricting yourself. So um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I found one that has the academic word list and you can actually create your own games on this website right here. And Educa Play has 17 different types of games from Riddle, Fill in the Blanks, Collection, Crossword, Dialogue, Dictation. Oh my gosh, there's so much there. This would be in the classroom. There is a template someone created that has timers. You remember this game, Password, where someone turns their back and someone else is describing the word? And so it has a self timer on it. And so they cannot say the word, but they, you know, they have to describe it to the person whose back is turned. I'm not sure how you would do this on online. I think that maybe you could just ask someone to not look, I guess, right? There is another, I won't show you this, but if you want to have a look at it, you know, for just individual quizzing, someone posted online this free PowerPoint quiz template that you go in and put the questions and the answers, and it's kind of like indiv individualized self-quizzing. Several different game sites that you can find on the OTAN website. Um, there are lots of those Jeopardy games and, and so on, some of those um, daytime game shows. Um, I like quizzes. Kahoot, honestly, I know everybody's used Kahoot so much and a lot of you really love it, but I feel like a loser when I play Kahoot because, so, because only the fast people get to win, right? So I like quizzes because it can be individual at your own pace, homework, and it can also be a live game. And some of you said Quizlet Live as well. Quizlet Live might be really tough because usually how we play that is in the classroom and students are coming together with their team, right? So try it. I don't know, I was gonna try it today, but I'm not going to, it's, it scares me a little bit. I don't think it will work very well at a distance. So let me show you, this, this is what Quizlet Live looks like. You go in, you can put a picture or you can just put a sentence frame and you can do multiple choice. It can be live or it can be individual. And this one is it, um, I quiz the lies. And um, when you create your account and, and invite students, you can keep track of how students are doing. So it gives you data. I haven't used it, I'm just telling you about it. All right, there are several games out there and um, 
I think that could be a really fun way to keep our students engaged as well. So I'm finishing up. I want you to keep in mind some of these key points from research, not from my brain, but this is what the research says, that we direct instruction for teaching vocabulary. We need to help students develop strategic communicative competence. So, so this is non speaker. So helping them learn ways to paraphrase or teaching them those words and expressions like what is the word for, okay? It's too easy for them to slip into their first language, especially when they're communicating with classmates. Always need a context. A word list, unless it's beginning ESL, all the words and of, you know, things in the bedroom, um, a context for that. So usually we're taking um, vocabulary from articles that students are reading or videos that they're watching. Um, we know this, and as someone said this in the beginning, um, I do, we do, then you do. So controlled practice first. So maybe that listening and repeating, matching clothes, and then stepping back a little bit. Um, gradual release of control is what that's called. We step back to activities that allow students to use the target words in meaningful, personalized ways. Make time for review in a systematic way with lots of re repetition. Remember, they need five to 20 or more exposures. And just because they learned these words in week two doesn't mean they'll remember all of them in week eight. So, you know, recycling, reviewing. Um, remember that forgetting occurs soon after learning. So you need some activity right after you've taught this or it's going to be gone tomorrow of fun review games motivational it forces them faster retrieval and writing vocabulary in one's own sentences strengthens memory of target vocabulary through generative processing okay there are we, we need to encourage in our students um, a love for learning words so I signed up for a couple of different um, word of the day you know, email lists. So I'm getting new words that I never even knew existed, like pultritude. Okay, so we could we can encourage our students to sign up for some of these um, different um, listservs or um, email subscriptions. There are lots of apps and so on. And um, you know, I think they still need to, even though there's so much technology, still need to have some way to keep this all together in maybe some sort of technology um, like notes, but still the old fashioned writing sometimes is the, you know, the best thing that a lot of students can do. It helps them remember better. So our objectives today were to consider how to choose vocabulary to explicitly teach, how we choose the words that we want to teach and need to teach, to learn and apply this six step process, and to discover some new technology tools. Ideally, we would have practiced a lot more, but with the condition the way it is with many of us on a, on a meeting, it's a little bit hard, I realize. So my goal for you was to walk away with at least one new idea. Did you? Are you going to walk away? So here's a final tool in just a moment. Did we accomplish our goal? Did you come up with at least one new idea for teaching vocabulary? What is one new activity or technology tool that you're going to try in your class to help students learn, retain, and use vocabulary? This is um, a great tool for exit tickets, could also be entry tickets. Mentimeter, so easy, free. If you want, uh, you know, the full package, of course, then you pay. But um, this is what you're going to do. You're going to go to www.menti.com and enter this code. If you have your phone, you can scan QR code here and it should take you right there. So the wonderful thing is Menti creates a QR code for you. Okay, so this, this one is often used um, in conferences. Um, to ask a large audience for questions. There, there are different ways the, the questions could be displayed. It could be a word cloud, it could be uh, multiple choice, it could be free text and so on. So let me show you what happens. So I'm seeing your live entries here. Quizzes, rewordify.com, WiserMe, Padlet, ThingLink. Quizzing, quizzes, Padlet, quizzes, 
Padlet. Oh, you like Padlet. I'm glad. Memorize Quizlet Padlet. Visual Dictionary Online. Linked. Oh, Computer Teacher. There we go. Maybe check that Merriam-Webster Visual Dictionary. Maybe there's Computer Parts. Why is there me linked? Okay, I see you really liked quizzes. I'm glad. And for the folks who couldn't get in, we've got Flipgrid, Padlet, Canva, Linked, Padlet, awesome. Live Worksheets. Awesome. So, and, and before you um, went to these, the Minty, um, everyone was extolling your virtues and so many great new ideas. Oh, good. They, this okay. is a winner. <laughs> okay, I just want to mention, don't jump into like 10 different things. Start, start first. If you're going to be doing online, start first with something you've used, your students know, you know. Then little by little, you know, say to your students, I want to try something new. Are you guys with me? Come on, let's try something new. Go slowly. Don't do all 10 different things that you learned in, in a, you know, a two weeks even. Go slowly. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Wow. Lots of different things. But I see some recurring things like Padlet. I think, you know, it's so easy, Padlet. Okay. So, wow. I really didn't think this would go for three hours. We're almost there. Well, we're at 3.30. Um, but we're going to end soon, and, and I'll take any of your questions. Okay. Um, again, this is the URL. It's the same. You can scan this QR code if you want to. Once you go there, I'm going to come back to this in just a minute. Let me just show you what it looks like. So if you want to, we're going to send out the link to the slides that you were viewing here. But if you go to the site, I also have the slides here. And they're embedded here. It's just a little slow. So there, um, the sites have that. And then the resources tab has tons of different resources, some of which you saw, but many others as well, okay? So that's the little site I created where you can find everything. And thank you so much for joining me today.